For their last offence, these delinquents expected a Borstal sentence. Instead, they were to be guinea pigs for a Home Office experiment in rehabilitation. For them, a judge had decided, this is your last chance. On the day of sentencing, they were taken from their detention centre to two terraced houses in Bristol, the first hostel of its kind in Britain. They'd be here for the next 12 months under the eye of Jim Dickey. For him, too, it was a new beginning. Good evening, Squire. Nice to see you. When I accepted the job, I was working in a borstal. I was terrified. I was really scared. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. A former assistant governor at a borstal, Jim Dickey became the man in charge at New Careers. I worked in the borstal system for a couple of years and quite frankly I found it appalling how out of touch and isolated such institutions were. Begun in the summer of 1973, New Careers, as the scheme was dubbed, was to try out a new way of dealing with offenders. Instead of being locked up, they would eventually be introduced to social work and then it was hoped become social workers. There were to be a hand-picked dozen, all male, between 18 and 21. What happens to them over the next few years, during the course of this film, could affect the future of the entire borsal system in this country. The Home Office were prepared to spend 4,000 a year per resident. Each was to be given six pounds a week spending, plus board and lodging, and the Home Office also paid for videotape equipment, which it was intended would enable them to keep track of their development at New Careers. That's when they'd mastered it. All the new students, as they were to be called, were encouraged to stick cards on the walls recording their objectives and faults. One of the first students was Kevin Cooper, a former Hells Angel. Kevin Cooper, age 20, sentenced October 1973 for driving while disqualified and going equipped for theft. He seemed to talk endlessly and we were rather excited by him at first. We we couldn't really make up our minds, though, whether or not it was fantasy or the guy had been reading too many Superman comics. I wasn't really sure. Kevin was sent out to work under supervision at a playgroup for children from a tough area like the one where he was brought up. The theory was that this way his disadvantaged background could be turned into an advantage. That's mine! There you are. you are, that Kevin also helped out at a primary school in Bristol. After some parental opposition and much debate, the Parent Teachers Association there agreed that those at New Careers could work with classes, provided there was always a teacher and a parent on hand when any of them were around. Kevin's energy and enthusiasm proved useful, especially on school expeditions. He didn't resent the fact that a parent or a teacher always hovered in the background. New careers were also experimenting with other ways of putting their ex-offenders into new roles. We can put people into situations that it might be difficult to put them in outside without too much damage, without uh, destroying relationships with other agencies or with people there, we can contain these within the hostel and can look at them analytically. People can experience them in a fairly safe kind of way. One method was through the game Risk It, a sort of monopoly in which those at the hostel played not only offenders, but also social workers and judges. Now, we've had some good reports from where you've been about you, and they're getting on pretty well. So I've decided to let you off with a caution. <laughs> I mean, I was, it was chipping it down my rain, wasn't it? And Jeff, a deputy administrator at the hostel, takes the role of an offender who's caused a fire in a park. Well, it was get a bit of dry wood together and make a fire, that was all. I mean, 
Yeah, my friend over there, he was in the park, you'll verify that, won't you, Jim? Yeah, you only put, you only put about six pints of uh, paraffin on it, you don't mean... Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> The facts of the case are briefly that the park is a is a, is a, is a private park and uh, people have been smashing smashing the fences down and using that as wood to burn the, to burn their spuds on in previous times when the hippies were in there the hippie colonies. <laughs> so so I, I you know and his, his past record is is pretty good I suppose. Oh, I'm definitely a person of previous good character. Oh, I mean, you know, from quite a nice home, been through college and everything. Jeff's a former heroin addict and was appointed as a go-between between the students and the administration. Well, in view of your good character, um, I'll send you to the hospital and clinic for one goal community service. Ooh. Oh, check there, you twit. The school Kevin was based in continued to keep a watchful eye on him, but he was becoming trusted and liked. By the time he finished there, he was highly popular with both children and staff, and Kevin Cooper looked like being the first new career's success story. But on the day he left, he'd not been found a new career. He was going home to Cardiff with only the faint possibility of the nursing job he wanted. Also, he still had to pay off over £500 on fines on motorbike offences committed long before he came to new careers. Stephen Robinson, aged 20, sentenced October 1973 for taking and driving away a vehicle without the owner's consent. Steve was a quicksilver character. He was in the same group as Kev. He had ideas, was very active, very anxious. He seemed the least happy with his situation. Steve was sent to the same primary school as Kevin. He was allowed to teach children handicrafts. His speciality was making butterflies out of lavatory rolls. He took his responsibilities rather seriously. Swearing in his corner of the classroom was severely frowned on. But a month after he'd been at New Careers, Steve went off the rails. He came back drunk with a broken nose three hours after his midnight deadline. His fellow residents got up and dutifully video recorded the scene. You want a commitment? I've got a bit of a commitment. Look, look at the state here. That's, that's what I feel, but he's the most important. I, but, I know, but self-discipline has got a bit of it. Yeah. Well, I reckon I have got self-discipline, but... Um, I disagree. Who you having? Yeah, you disagree, but only for tonight. But beforehand, I've had self-discipline. I've done it. I've done it work. I've done everything that's set for me. I've done extra. I guess I felt like I had some security by being here a bit longer. Then a couple of you. I thought, well, fuck it. You know, I'll, I'll let off a bit of steam and take the consequences because I've been here a month and I feel I've been trusted. But I know it's wrong now, but at the time it felt good. But it's still not getting a commitment, okay? <coughs> For Steve, that scene was a traumatic one. Soon afterwards, he completely changed his appearance and threw himself into a written project on what facilities are available for younger teenagers from backgrounds like his own. Finally, it was decided Steve had acquired organising skills and was ready to leave. I think Steve was the one, when I look back, that uh, he's one of the guys that I really felt closest to as a friend. Jim Dickey had been able to fix up a place for Steve at a home for ex-prisoners in Exeter. Steve was to be in charge. That come out in the committee meeting, keep a look. But although his accommodation was to be free, Steve's placement was temporary and unpaid. It could hardly be called a new career. Lionel Doody, nicknamed Tinny, aged 17, 
sentenced September 1973 for burglary and for taking and driving away a vehicle without the owner's consent. I turned up late on a Friday night at the hostel and there was this wee character running up and down, really sort of, uh, looking a bit lost, a um, bit anxious looking straight through me, looking at me as though I was the milkman. Um, I began to feel a bit anxious. Then I discovered that he was a new student. I, you could have knocked me down with a feather. Tinney, together with a few others from New Careers, was sent one morning a week to the children's ward of a local hospital for the mentally handicapped. At first, there was plenty of enthusiasm for the work. I found out the other half, you know, not the people who don't feed and steal. Uh, it really interests me, like, the, way, the way they can live like that and still have money in, me, in the pockets, like, which was one of the main reasons I went to feed. Who paid the money off? But soon afterwards, Tinid found himself with a thousand pounds. His father, whom he'd scarcely known, had died in an accident at work and there'd been compensation. Tinney began to lose interest in all his projects at the hostel and spent much of his time organising and financing nights out with the boys. The money went fast. Good day. Eventually, Tinney was called in for a crisis meeting with Jim Dickey and the probation officer. Crisis group, definitely, yes. It's very disturbing, I think, to have somebody about. He's been here for so long and quite obviously just doesn't want to know about the change that's required and about... I mean, as far as getting into the education programme is concerned, you've done about that much. I don't think you're it's able to hold the responsibility. Yeah, but I mean, we're working what we're going to do yourself. I've never been quite sure of what I wanted to do anyway, when, when I left school or when I, when I was even in the third or... It was just ideas that come into my head, what people have said. And, you know, I thought, well, yeah, you know, crack it, get in there and see what you can do. And, just doesn't last, just doesn't work. Have you any ideas as to what you want to do now? Get a job, any job. The question then remains, where do you go to, I think? A dog. Oh. I've made some inquiries about a possible project in Gloucestershire called The Link. You're going to go up to Gloucester this weekend. You're going to see if this place is OK. You're going to come back here. You're going to let us know whether it's OK. If it is OK, you're going to go straight back up there. You're going to get a week to get a job. You're not going to piss about getting jobs that you can't do. You're going to make a point of getting a decent job. Then you're going to go the following week. Well, I was just looking at possibilities, you know. I know, but it's once it's a time it's done. OK, now, see, see you Monday, Chris. I'll and you later. Don't, don't forget to let you go now, will you? Oh, Cheer you. Bye. I mean, that, I mean, the time he broke through on the group, I, you know, I was getting messages that the situation was much more positive, but that's just slipped back. It was just a... He'll come in flashes. This place just doesn't have his friend. How many spends? He's got too many other things going. Yeah. You know, he, he, he just doesn't have mature enough to be able to handle something like this. And he may have to go to Borstal eventually before he... He finally starts to sort himself out. He may, be not, he may not have been hit hard enough. Although Jim Dickey could have sent Tinney back to court for resentencing, he didn't. Tinney stayed and made sure he was in on the new career's outing to Cheddar Gorge. He again was from a working class, big city background, and a trip into the country was very much a novelty for all of them. Oh, he's got a big... Oh, he's got a shovel right there, Len. Yeah. They're really nice, Charles, aren't they? Look at his orange. Look at him all flap here, bloody... Broken. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Probably old. The dropping off, yeah, because they drop off every year. Yeah. Oh, no. Gentlemen, there's the bone here, though. There's one, nothing off the road. You seen the bone sticking up? There's a bull over there. Look. Oh no! Read that, John. What? There. What's it say? Four. Ah, oh, no. Rip off. Cut. Not okay. You've got to pay to go in. Okay. I'll leave it off, eh? 
Frank Palmer, aged 18, sentenced December 1973 for two offences of theft. Frank seemed to hide himself a lot. I never got to know him terribly well at all. For about the first month he was there, I think you could have counted the words I said to him in a couple of hands, you know, he was... He, he really kept himself to himself. No, you do not. You do not. Yeah, he's only one of the folks that go around feeding the kids here. Frank worked well with mentally handicapped children, but was wary with the others back at the hostel. Well, it's got 10 30 now since this afternoon, John. Nevertheless, he was a good organiser, quick and constructive, for instance, in getting everyone to work out the hostel's weekly timetable. So I'm going to meet some school teachers and you this, no, this week. <coughs> During his time in Borstal, Frank had worked in the kitchens and when he was responsible for preparing the hostel meal, did it with precision and flair. But the reluctance to talk out his problems remained. Well, what's the point of talking about it then? What do you mean, what's the point? That's the whole point of talking about it. You know, that people shouldn't, shouldn't be covering up for each other. If you're pulling a lot of fast ones, Frank, I'm certainly not going to sit back and let you, let yeah, you get away. Yeah, I'm talking about what I've been doing round there, and you, you know, you may go off to the coppers or something. That's why I'm looking at it, honestly. Well, but yeah, right, maybe you know, I think, that's, I think that's probably problem. a fair, a fair point. Um, I don't know exactly how I would handle it. If you told me that you'd go and hit an old lady over the head and nicked her, nicked her handbag, I probably would go and tell the police. You know, I, I'm quite sure that's not the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. I don't want to exclude that, but I get the feeling <coughs> it's more likely to be things that have been happening inside the house. OK, you may have been flashing and broad me. You know, I wouldn't go and tell the fuzz about that because they've been asking about the same Still, there was reluctance to open up. The administrators were looked on by Frank with suspicion and he became even more wary than ever after the talking out sessions or crisis groups as they were known at New Careers. Nevertheless, he enjoyed helping out at a Bristol youth club. The children there took to him readily and he to them. By now, the video equipment had become little more than a plaything. Frank was using it to record a gym class with patients at a mental hospital. A new, new careerist was in charge of the group. Colin Pridmore, aged 20, sentenced June 1974 for breaking and entering shop premises. Colin was unctuous. He, in some ways, he was a bit like a kind of Uriah Heep. He could change the tone of his voice. Uh, at will, and he used his voice very, very effectively, but it grated a bit. Colin and Frank soon became close friends, but Colin didn't share Frank's enthusiasm for his projects. Apart from the gym classes, Colin preferred to take his 12-month stretch in a somewhat more leisurely way. Yeah. It's a girl I used to go up with. Vulcan swallow. Tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> By this time, enthusiasm at New Careers seemed to have sagged all round. The only thing likely to arouse some enthusiasm was a game of touch rugby in the park outside the hostel. Colin especially enjoyed physical exercise. Happy 
Colin's 21st birthday. It was also to be his engagement party and the occasion for a new career's reunion. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't fall out. Colin. Turn around. No, it's not. <laughs> Come on. Come on, play the part. Everybody got to say speech. 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 Oh, my God. Come on, how are you doing? Ready? Up. Oh. But problems were growing. Colin was getting on badly with one of the young staff and a visit by Denny Briggs, a psychologist who'd helped to start new careers in America, became the occasion to have it out. I just don't, sometimes I see myself as a nursemaid. And perhaps I sit, perhaps I'll take that too far. I don't think that's what they're asking for at all. Look, Denny, you come out, you know, I'm with the guys all week, and this is the impression that I get that sometimes yeah. that the con in and playing the game sometimes. How much help have been asked from you? Have you asked? From me? Yeah. Very little. The first time it was boiling down, everybody has um, come to a conclusion. You started twisting words. I'm able to take abuse, but when I give abuse back, it's not taken. And no, I'm that, saying that I twist words. Yeah, but that may be what they're saying too, is that that's part of the job of the interview. To sit and take abuse? Yeah, to be a bit like a sponge and absorb things. Well, that's not the way I play the linguist's job. That's, that's purely as a person, you know. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to, yeah, but I mean, purely as a person, I'm not going to sit and take abuse and not give it back. I don't see your team as being critical of you at all. This is what, this comes back to the point that I said, we don't know which way to take it, we don't know which way to approach you. If we did, and then we could, could get together as a team and work I, together. I get the feeling that you don't really believe that Colin opens up to you. Um, I can understand that because I feel that a lot of the time as well. Um, it, it's, that, it's that bit more difficult, but I find that probably the best way to get it to happen is for you to be open, for you to sort of make it, to lay yourself bare a bit. Mm. You do that with me, um, but maybe you don't do it with the guys. We managed to change. At least things were going pretty well for some of the new career's old boys. Kevin had got a job as a lift mechanic, Nothing. and by now he'd got his fines down to almost 300 pounds. Nothing. And Steve had settled in at the hostel in Exeter. He related well to the other ex-prisoners there. Things are a bit rosier now, getting the place done up. You know, I'm get, at least I'm collecting the rent, and that's all the committee we've got, you know, worried about at the moment. And keeping the neighbours quiet, so... I ain't doing too much, you know, but I'm sort of, it's okay, a bit nervous. But everyone back at the hostel in Bristol knew even Steve's job was only temporary. It was now clear that there were few, if any, new careers around. Trust was crumbling. The scheme had reached a critical point. Two lots of money had gone missing. The first lot had come, had come back mysteriously. The second lot went and in some ways it, it kind of underlined a general feeling of frustration about the whole issue of things being knocked off. We felt extremely annoyed, a wee bit desperate. Um, somebody was really pushing us to the limit. Saturday, five had walked and mysteriously reappeared. Frank was suspected. I suspected somebody else I wasn't there. Maybe we all suspected, but most of us had alibis. <coughs> That's a load of crap, Colin. You and Cliff were absolutely, well, Cliff in particular, were absolutely adamant that it was Frank. I don't try and back out of it. Now. You know, if you suspect the guy, tell him. I'm not quite sure. Oh, I just went into the office and we did not move from our office. The only people that left that room after that, we were all doing that play space session. The only people that left that room after they'd all gone out, after it being nicked, was Dick, Colin, 
Cliff, Lorenzo, and uh, Paul. They're the only people that went out because I stayed in with Colin and we were talking about various things. I met, do you remember that time when money got nicked? And I didn't move out of that room. Frank, in a tight corner, turns to the producer of this film, who'd also been there the previous day, for a vital alibi. That's when the money was found. I can certainly back Frank up on that. There was a long, we had a long talk in the in that room immediately after the first one. It's been played around, but you are saying it's Frank. That's what I'm feeling. The fiber can't possibly be Frank, as he's just said, he's explained that. So, you know. It could be one of you three using Frank because he's the ball guy. Yeah, but there's some guy going around ripping off stuff and not accepting it and not admitting it to, even to his fucking self. At least I'm willing to come out and say, yeah, I'm willing to steal. I mean, you know, none of us are perfect. I mean, we've all, we've all, we've all stole before. So what else I'm looking for? Um, let's put it like this, I don't trust one of you bastards in you, not one single one of you. And that's true. So how can you help me if I can't let you in? Because I don't trust any of you. It's as simple as that. I'm going to go out of here, phone the police, tell them that three pounds was stolen yesterday. Somebody's got the common sense to say, I took it. Then we can make arrangements for paying it back. I think I copped out. Well, I didn't go to the police, nobody came out. We didn't find out then who the thief was. Uh, the whole group, I think, epitomised the feeling of frustration and uh, the fact that we were at a really low point then, I think. The, the group, I think, was in the process of breaking up. Um, a number of the boys there uh, got into further trouble. Um, but. It really was quite a low point. For some, however, new careers had helped considerably. Kevin Cooper's motorbike, on which he'd committed so many of his offences, was now rusting in the backyard, and he had just £200 worth of fines left to pay. Why had he put his previous way of life behind him? I don't know, I think... Uh, probably seen a light or something like that, you know. I just don't bother. It, was, it don't even enter my head, that thought. Eventually, Kevin fulfilled his ambition. Now he's a nursing assistant at a hospital for the mentally handicapped, and he has only £19 worth of fines still to pay off. Tinney's gone back to Birkenhead. The polio arm he'd got as a child doesn't affect his game of pool, but unemployment's especially high on Merseyside, and it's affected his search for a job. While a child, he was abandoned by his mother, being brought up by his grandmother, with whom he now lives. do me a bit of good, like, you know, stop me from... Stop me from doing what I was doing before I went there. So, I mean, it helped me a lot, like, yeah. Does his grandmother think new careers has changed Tinney? Oh, he's changed, yes. 
definitely. Definitely. Changed. Oh, love you. <laughs> In what way does she think it changed him? Well, it... Well, it taught him a lesson. And he doesn't knock around with any... gangs, you know. Bandits. But he did, when he was here before. Don't see them now. Don't see him at all. It's on his own. Of course, he's caught him. And that's made a difference. <laughs> yes, big difference. Big difference. The only thing, if we got a job, we could... Take it out and have a few drinks with it. Better luck for Colin. After various upsets, he'd gone back to Swansea. There, he'd succeeded in getting a job as a helper in an old people's home, while he'd gone back home to live. Back to the familiar neighbourhood where he'd been brought up sort of introduced me to social work, which is one thing I've never done before. And now I'm really interested in social work, as you can see by the position I got now. What did he think had brought about the change? Well, with going by experience, which I've had in prison, it's, it's just terrible. It's, you just feel as though you're condemned. With new careers, at least you have got freedom. And, of course, the right type of person can make it at new careers. Sixteen days after that interview was recorded, Colin was arrested in a stolen car while still on probation. Now he's serving two years in prison while his fiancée waits in Bristol. Meanwhile, Steve's girlfriend Sarah joined him at the hostel in Exeter and soon they got engaged. She's fitting in quite well. She does me cooking, which I like, you know. She cooks good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to be sort of out and out and about and proving that you can do it. And, New careers is much, very good. It's done me a lot. It's done me a lot. Frank also got work in an old people's home, a job he found on his own initiative. <laughs> He's stuck at it. A year after leaving New Careers, he's still out of trouble. Nevertheless, he remains very sceptical about New Careers. It's good for an experience, for that's about all of them. See that it could help anybody in any way. Doesn't he think it helped him at all? In some ways, it has. It, uh, it got me to understand that I was the problem and not the excuses, which I find in all cases was the reason of me getting into trouble. And does he think the change permanent? No, no. Could he get into trouble again? I can't see no reason why I couldn't. Yeah, I could see myself possibly get into trouble, yeah. We have helped a number of people to stay out of institutions. We have proved that former offenders are not pariahs, that they have got something constructive to contribute to society. Steve and Sarah's wedding day. Jim Dickey isn't able to make it. He's left New Careers now and gone back home to a job on the Clyde side. Steve's now a social worker at a centre for alcoholics and a married man. For New Careers, an epitome of success. But 15 of the 24 who've been at New Careers have gone back inside. For the time being, the attempts to turn delinquents into respectable citizens are continuing. Oh, sorry, we're all sorry, as you As we were. Get in the car, Steve. 